Jai Bhim, Jai Mulnivasi. Welcome you all to the MNT News Network. Today is Sunday, and it's time for a special prime time session in English. Before we we move ahead, as today we are going to discuss on a very important topic. I would like to request the viewers on Facebook to share this important video on their personal page, Facebook wall, and watch from there. Viewers on YouTube are requested to like, comment. and share this video with all friends relatives and social media so that this information will reach to the maximum people today we have very special and distinguished guest with us it's our pleasure to have professor michael forman with us and today we are going to interact with him on a very important topic that is discrimination civil rights and affirmative actions michael forman is the basically director <coughs> Civil Rights Appellate Clinical uh, Clinic and Clinical Professor of Law. He focuses on appellate representation in civil rights issues and employment discrimination cases, and directs Penn State Laws Civil Rights Appellate Clinic. He also teaches the Advanced Employment Discrimination and the Employment Relationship courses at Penn State Law School. He is recipient of Karanjee Medal for Outstanding Heroism. and the professor forman has been honored by sipensburg university with the jesse s distinguished alumnus award now i would like to welcome our distinguished guest professor michael forman and we are going to have a very engaging <coughs> session with him on the various aspects of employment discrimination and affirmative actions re <coughs> related law in united states and in comparison with the in a, in india welcome professor welcome to the mnt news thank you thank you and, and thank you for having me uh i guess it, it is evening there here is early morning in united states but i am looking forward to a great discussion here professor <clears throat> tell us about the kind of work and your professional engagement in the field of quality rights affirmative actions in the united states i know you are deeply engaged into the protection of civil rights and the particularly the your fight against discrimination based on various identified grounds like race mind and the protection of minority group is applauded in across the united states of america so kindly tell us about your professional journey so far Uh, well, part of that will depend how much time you have, but I'll try to be brief on my professional journey. Uh, I, just to be totally honest with you and the viewers, when I went to law school, I was going to do environmental law, uh, and then I decided in the middle of my law school career that I wanted to do work that I thought. possibly naively that I could change the world and I started to doing uh civil rights work uh once I got out of law school and, and at that point again to be honest uh I was a bit naive I knew academically about discrimination about oppression but I I given where I came from a very small farming rural community I did not see that as closely as I did once i got out once i got out of law school and started practicing first with a state agency the pennsylvania human relations commission where we prosecuted violations that was really my education in my first group of cases that i dealt with were very individual cases ugly cases it was very individual talking dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace uh race discrimination unequal play claims those type of claims which is where i really got my education and my start uh one of the first eye opening experiences back then and i'm going back a few years a few decades um was a case that went to the state supreme court that dealt with the payment of uh women who worked for the court system of all places they worked for the court system uh they were called administrators males were called clerks they did exactly the same thing and women were paid substantially less we ultimately went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and won that case 
And then from there, I did work. I, I left there and I worked for the NAACP uh, national headquarters uh, and then the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the Lawyers Committee and Civil Rights. And in all those, I got a, a very sobering experience to, to all types of discrimination, um, particularly race-based discrimination throughout the South, uh, situations where low wager people of color were paid low wages, not promoted, uh, disciplined more frequently, harassment in the workplace. And then when I was at the Lawyers Committee, we also did cases that dealt with discrimination in the housing area and the discrimination in uh, the educational forum. So that was sort of my journey. And then ultimately I came here to the uh, Penn State University where I run a civil rights clinic and we do actual cases. And one of my views as it developed was my initial career was trying to help individuals. Uh, and then as I moved on, we tried to focus on more systemic changes. Um, and during that course of time, of course, I, I was involved in litigating some of the affirmative action cases and some of the early division, uh, diversity initiatives. So that, that was sort of my journey as to how I got here today. So, <clears throat> so Professor, <clears throat> how do you see the discrimination, particularly based on race, cost and color on a global canvas because this discrimination the very basis of this discrimination as identified by the states is very superficial it's not natural it's not something which is inherent it is man-made so how do you see this the very basis of this this, this discriminations globally I think that I think that's an excellent question, and my answer will will be fairly simplistic. Uh, I whether it's I, I think human nature tends to be, from what we've seen historically, is one group wants to feel, or one person wants to feel that they are superior in some sense to someone else. And that would entitle them to uh, additional benefits, rights, whatever you call it. And, and you can do it in a very micro scale uh, or in a global scale. And I think on a global scale, uh, while each country and nations deal with it differently, at the heart of it, that's that's the type of thing that you're dealing with. Uh, I hate. I, 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 I hesitate to use this, but the the reggae singer Bob Marley has a song, uh, "No More War." But he talks about this issue of until we uh, until we're in a position where no one believes they're superior to other people, there's going to continually to be trouble uh, nationwide and globally. And I paraphrase don't. I paraphrase Bob Marley, but that's in fact, uh, I think, at the heart of it. Um, I'm not sure that yeah. answered your question, but but yes, uh, because uh, even in the legal instruments and particularly the international treaties and the conventions and the particularly the domestic laws which we examine either of United States of America or United Kingdom or even India, the it talks about equality. But in theory, it, it remains only in theory. In practice, in general society, which of which we are part of, there is a, a lot of discrimination based on all these identify, identified criteria, that is race, caste, color, sex, and all these groups. So my uh, the, uh, I would like to take you to the another interesting development which has happened in the United Kingdom, particularly with respect to the caste, because in Indian, typical Indian sub society, everything depends on your caste, whether you belong to an upper caste or lower caste, and the particularly the social structure, the power structure, the state power is, uh, has been enjoyed by the particular group 
and of the upper castes and the big sense of education and awakening which is a global phenomena across the community the castes now the depressed class or the lower strata uh, uh, the people belonging to the lower strata in india are asserting their political power they are seeking their share in the political sphere so basically the how do you see the caste as a phenomena because this is the glo- age of globalization the indians are migrating across the globe and a large population is migrating so in recent times the united kingdom there was a very uh, discussion in the united kingdom under the equality act of 2010 to have caste as an identified identif- <coughs> as a phenomena where to under the equality protection act of 2010 subsequently they did not subsequently they did not uh, uh, include in their legislation but the legislators were of firm belief that the caste there is a discrimination based on caste in united kingdom and it needs to be curbed in the beginning what is your opinion about the castes uh, and the particularly migrants indian in united states whether um, did have have you ever been have you ever been encountered with this kind of discrimination in, in typical united states society uh in terms of I'll, i'll try to unpack that question in a couple different ways to your very specific question at the end i personally have not been involved in situations where the caste system particularly as, as the indian caste system uh has resulted in me being involved in a piece of litigation now i have i i've heard anecdotally in the united states where we have seen that playing out is in domestic relations in uh domestic help within a home but i haven't personally been involved in those cases to your broader question uh about cask and the equality act um let me let me try to uh, unpack that two different ways one is a point you made at the very beginning of your question about v- virtually every nation every country etc has something to say we're striving for equality but the fundamental nature is one what do we mean by equality does it mean purely equal treatment or does it mean equal opportunity to compete and those are two important concepts that tend to divide people when they talk about this discussion um because then you will have an a law that tries to implement one of those things in 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 the United States the bottom line is one part of the discrimination law is it's unlawful to discriminate intentionally i can't treat you differently because of your race your sex your national origin etc and if i do that's a violation of the law your equality act the equality act uh has a very comparable thing Now that has been interpreted in the United States to basically say I can't take race into account for anything. So if you apply that concept literally, I could not do affirmative action, I could not do diversity, etc. The other side of the legal enforcement in the United States is this concept called disparate impact uh where there's not in an intent to discriminate but in fact it does discriminate um one of the early cases just so the viewers get a sense of what we're talking about uh some of the early cases were height and weight requirements for police officers and the view was you had to be a certain size a certain weight to be able to be a police officer well we found out that that disqualified 99% of all women it wasn't intentionally implemented to disqualify but it did uh and that would be a disparate impact in the United States courts and our law recognize that that forecloses opportunity it's a disparate impact uh claim and that would be unlawful under the guidelines in the United States 
Now, when you turn to cast, my understanding and based upon the research I've done is uh, the tribunals that were looking to add cast, cast specifically, uh, had a trouble with defining what that group would look like for a disparate impact claim. You know, who would be included if I'm saying that uh, some employment criteria has uh, a, a disparate impact or screens out a large number of people of a particular race, well, you know what that race is, you know what the origin is, et cetera. It, and I think they struggled with how do we define caste, but under the Equality Act uh, and in the United States, we may be able to get to caste-based discrimination through this disparate impact. And the argument would basically be hey, this criteria, this denial of service has a disparate impact on a racial minority that tends to be in the lower class, and you can try to get to it that way. But I think you're exactly right. It, it's, it's very difficult in terms of how you apply these laws. It's one thing to say, yes, we have an equality, but if you have a, an interpretation of the law that says you can't take race into account at all, you can't take national origin, then it becomes very difficult for you to actually achieve equality um, because you're not allowing somebody to have the equal opportunity to compete. Did that? You have used the expression equal opportunity to compete and equal opportunity as a facet of equality rights. And I also, uh, and we also know that the affirmative actions and the particularly reservation in India is nothing about, but rather than a, an effort from the state, from the point, state point of view to give equal opportunity to those who have been historically deprived. And so to, so as to enable them and to prove their existence as a human being they, so that, that they can ex <clears throat> uh, so now the next question which pertains to the affirmative action policies in public employment as well as admission in educational institution because in India we have the reservation system uh, where the uh, in the so right from the schools to university level and even the postgraduate courses also are super specialty courses also where the state institutions or state funded institutions and universities have the reservation in favor of constitutionally protected class particularly scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and other backward class so the constitution uses the expression indian constitution uses the expression backward class of citizens and which include am i audible now you are yes so which includes scheduled castes and scheduled tribes also in indian context so do you see the affirmative actions and the reservation policy as an effective tool to mitigate historical operations and injustices to a particular race and particularly particular group of society in indian context scheduled caste and scheduled tribes or even the backward class of citizens i think it can be an effective tool but how effective it is will depend on how your courts allow that to be implemented and whether they're in fact going to allow it to be implemented uh, in one sense your your constitution would would allow more affirmative action than our country for instance has have have allowed uh, in terms of moving forward um, I, I can compare it well I, I can compare it a little bit to the United States in, in to try to give you a little bit of background of how it plays out in the United States. Uh, there's sort of three fundamental questions when you're talking about either affirmative action or diversity. And we'll talk a little bit later about 
that there is a conceptual difference between affirmative action and diversity, both from a practical point of view and from a legal point of view. But one of the things within the United States that you deal with is the first question you have to ask is, who, who are you dealing with? Because if it is, and, and I'm ta- I will talk just about employment here, and then we can talk about education and other areas, but in employment, if you are a private employer, there's one set of rules to apply. But if you're a public, if you're a governmental employer, if you're a state employer, you work for the United States, you work for any government entity, then the Constitution applies. And there's a different set of standards that apply constitutionally. Um, and the view generally within the United States, private employers may have some ability to do more in the affirmative action and diversity than the public is because the government can, because the cover- government's constrained by uh, the U- United States Constitution, the 14th Amendment. Uh, and that's where we go back to the point I made before that one interpretation of the United States law says you cannot discriminate based upon race or ancestry or ethnic origin. Uh, And if you take that into account, that is a violation of the law. That's sort of the top level. The Supreme Court of the United States then has recognized, well, there may be some limited circumstances where you can can use race, and I will limit it to race, not gender, uh, to try to overcome past discrimination. Uh, That's where affirmative action came in and how it's been justified in the United States as an exception to say, you can use race in a limited manner. uh, Then there's a set of qualifications in order to be able to use race in either the private setting or the governmental setting. And I can get into the details on on what those two mean and how you prove it, but I I also don't want to bore your listeners. Professor, you have mentioned two two very important aspects about the implementation of affirmative actions be it United States or even Indian. In, in, from Indian perspective also, it becomes very important that how the judiciary and the institution of judiciary is viewing it and what response it has when it comes to the effective implementation. And the, another aspect which you have highlighted is about the whom you are engaging with, whether it is a public employment or it is a private run corporation's employment opportunities. There are two set of laws and uh, which is applicable in United States, rightly pointed out. I will be coming up to the first point first. Uh, first now, first point, which which is very important because as a practitioner of law before Supreme Court of India, I witness that the there is a kind of judicial apathy on part of Supreme Court of India when it comes to the proper implementation of reservation issue in Indian context in public employment. We do not have any reservation or affirmative action policy with respect to the private corporations and the private companies or private institutions in India. So when it comes, so the reservation is presently confined to public institutions and the government jobs. Now, what I have witnessed and we the experience says that we have amendments after amendments to the constitution of India to implement the reservation policy, like reservation in promotion, the ba- filling off of the backlog vacancies with regard to the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, and then the accelerated promotion as well, because the constitution mandates that the eligible candidates from depressed class or the constitutionally protected class, particularly scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, should also reach to the top of the post. So there is a kind of reservation in promotion as well. In India, in last decade and 
more than around 20 years now it's more than two decades uh, a decade or two the judiciary is saying that the laws are valid constitutional but it imposes some restrictions some conditions and the executive does not implement it so how do you see this problem with very specific to indian setup and what are the suggestions which you can give as a practitioner of law and as a professional who is working with regard to the protection of civil rights in united states again what i would probably look at is and I want to make it very clear, and I would contrast it with the United States because in one sense, it sounds a little bit uh, that we could transpose some of what is happening in the United States to some of the situation in India. Let's talk about private employers first in the United States, which you had indicated, they are not subject to a mandate constitutionally to prefer, pursue affirmative action. Our courts, uh, the United States Supreme Court has made it clear that private employers are not mandated to pursue either diversity efforts or affirmative action efforts, with one exception, which I'll, I'll explain. Uh, but there was a case that went to the United States up Supreme Court where uh, employers, here it was actually a union, but they wanted to voluntarily do it. Uh, they sort of recognize that if we're going to be competitive in, in the in the world, we want to be able to have a diverse workforce. We don't have a diverse workforce. We want to make sure, one, that individuals are, are, are represented across our workforce and are promoted. And the Supreme Court of the United States says, we don't believe the restrictions in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which is our our law that applies to private employers it says you can't discriminate forbids voluntary affirmative action but in order to do it you need to have a couple different show a couple different criteria one is you need to be addressing an underrepresentation that you're not just going to pursue a quota to have you know equal representation but there's underrepresentation within your workforce um and it's in your workforce you you're not doing it to remedy societal discrimination generally you need to show the underrepresentation in your workforce and you need to show that what you're doing is limited in nature to be able to reach uh, a laudable goal not a quota a goal uh and you're not going to do that in perpetuity and they say if you do that then you can then you can validly pursue an affirmative action program. Uh, now, the caveat I was going to say is the one time you can mandate, and this is something that you could possibly pursue in India, is under the Title VII of the Civil Rights. If I sue an employer for, and we'll say race-based discrimination and fail it to promote, uh, and I win that case, one of the remedies the court could order is we want an affirmative action program in place to be able to bring the employer up to where they're supposed to be. For example, I was involved in a piece of litigation uh, in the state of Mississippi with the hiring of police, and they had no black police officers. We won that case. We entered into a a, well, there was an order that they had to hire 50% for every white police officer they hired. They had to hire a police until they were able to redress the past discrimination in their workplace. And that was court ordered affirmative action. Uh, that was not a voluntary uh, type of affirmative action. So that's what's happening in the, on the private sector. When you go to the public sector, the Supreme Court has looked at it more differently and that said, and this gets into the history of the United States, that a lot of the discrimination in the United States was government discrimination was, was by the states, by the individual states. 
so the interpretation of the law in the United States was if the government is going to use race for anything, then first you need to show that there is a compelling governmental interest, that the government really needs to use race, and that the way they are utilizing race is, and the term is narrowly tailored, that you don't know any more than is necessary. So when you go to the United States, and particularly the education cases, uh, that's what's being fought, like the university of admission to the University of Michigan, which was a public entity and therefore subject to the constitutional protections, uh, that's the theory you would use there uh, in order to achieve it. But it, at least in the United States, it's a much higher standard. Thank you for the, this elaboration. And uh, what I could make, I will take another two points from your this answer and i will be discussing about it you have mentioned about the title 7 of the civil rights act 1964 of the united states of america right so uh the and the another aspect which you uh highlighted is about the how it differs from the uh, when it comes to the public institution and the private corporations and the affirmative actions in United States of America. The, my next question to you, that kindly elaborate upon the Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act 1964 and what are the penalties, major penalties, what are the, whether the comp uh, any companies or the any size, what is the size, what should be the size of the private corporation, whether it should be uh, and how, uh, to, uh, how many employees should be there so uh, when the, the man, uh, diversity is mandated or the uh, the employers have to recruit the my, from the minority segment or the minority groups, uh, whether uh, <clears throat> it is the same threshold for a c company having uh, whether it differs from the turnover point of view or a strength from, uh, from the strength of the employees or the size of the companies also matters because a company like Walmart or the Facebook uh, private corporations which are there in the so giant in nature in, uh, in from the United States uh, there should be different threshold of penalties or the uh, uh, requirement or their obligations towards the uh, fellow citizens under the law of the United States. Can you elaborate upon this? I, I can and you'll have to cut me off if I get too long. But but first of all, just for, for your listeners, the Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act of, was passed in 1964 and it the law basically says it's unlawful to discriminate in employment uh, based upon race, sex, national origin, color, uh, a not age, uh, religion. Uh, it's our general discrimination law. It applies to any employer of 15 or more employees. Uh, it does not cover the very small employers, but anybody, any employer that is 15 or more is covered by the discrimination laws. Um, and what that means generally is you cannot discriminate based upon those protected classifications. Uh, and if you do, uh, there are a couple different avenues. You can go through what is would be the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the federal agency that forces the law, uh, or you can ultimately get to United States court uh, and if there is a violation, let's say I am not hired because of my race uh, and I go to court and I win, the court can order the employer to, uh, one, hire me, two, pay me any wages I would have received because of the discrimination. If it's particularly egregious, uh, they can order compensatory damages for emotional pain and suffering or punitive damages. And now within Title VII, and I won't get into the details, 
the amount of damages that you can recoup for punitive damages and pain and suffering are capped based upon the size of an employer. So smaller employers would not be subject to the same higher rates that larger employers. So that's sort of the general concept. There is actually uh, a, a meaningful enforcement entity uh, and it is utilized uh, quite often in the United States. Now, having said that, back to your other point, uh, there is no mandate for me as an employer, small or large, to hire someone because, I, because of the race, uh, unless I develop an, a valid affirmative action program. And that goes back to the point I was made before, if I'm an employer, uh, I can't say, well, you know, uh, we've had a terrible history of discrimination based upon race, and therefore I want to hire, uh, my next four hires are going to be people of color or women. Uh, I have then made a decision because of race, and unless I have a valid affirmative action program, I have violated Title VII. Uh, now, Frankly, most smaller employees, one, you're not going to be able to justify an affirmative action program because you need to be able to have sufficient numbers. Now, when you go to the larger corporations, like you were saying, a Walmart, et cetera, they have sufficient numbers where they could show underutilization. And if there's past discrimination within their workplace, not societal, but within their workplace, they could justify that. Uh, if they chose to do it. What we found in the United States, quite frankly, is a lot of the larger corporations, private, private corporations, some of the ones you name, are ones that want to pursue affirmative action, want to pursue diversity programs because they recognize to be competitive in a global world, they need to look like the world. It can't just be all people looking like me, white males, doing this. Uh, so they 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 would like to implement uh, those programs. Now, having said that, there are groups in the United States, and there there are there's litigation on the other side saying you cannot do that because you are in fact discriminating because of race, etc. And we should not be doing that as a country. And, and that's one of the battles. Um, to give you an example, uh, well, <laughs> if you go to several of the United States Supreme Court cases dealing not with affirmative action, and keep in mind, affirmative action is actually doing something to remedy either past discrimination, uh, et cetera, as opposed to diversity, where you want to have a workforce that represents the society in which you work, two separate concepts. Um, but the last sort of diversity case that went to the United States Supreme Court uh, was the parents involved that dealt with, with diversity in uh, elementary schools and whether the school could in fact pursue diversity effort uh our current chief justice of the supreme court wrote in his opinion that the way to stop discriminating based upon race is to stop discriminating based upon race his mindset is you should not be able to use race as a basis for an affirmative action program or for a diversity program, because what it does is separate people into categories and he believes you need to move forward. Other justices say in order for us to get beyond past discrimination, we have to take race into account in order to be able to accomplish true equality. So we have members of our United States Supreme Court that that have polar opposite views of when you should be able to use race in in that case in the educational setting, but I would assume they would have the same views in the employment setting. Professor, that brings us to 
another important aspect particularly do you see that the when a company or the corporation implements affirmative action program in employment whether the efficiency of the administration or the efficiency gets impacted because in india what we uh, the generally the argument is that the i'm sorry i lost you here yeah sorry sir uh, he uh, had a uh, 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 connection is disconnected so just uh, appear a minute with us uh, he will be there uh, okay yeah so basically uh, he was discussing about the overall uh, uh, affirmative actions and uh, uh, when we are providing uh, any uh, uh, as far as the indian cons uh, indian uh, uh, conditions are considered so in such cases where there are uh, specifically uh, the uh, there are uh, the constitutional provisions are there uh, and uh, with the help of these constitutional provisions uh, the governments uh, are being asked to uh, uh, implement uh, uh, these uh, uh, policies under uh, cases of affirmative actions so uh, when uh, uh, under the affirmative action such cases are initiated uh, whether uh, such provisions uh, 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 it is said that the if we are recruiting uh, people from such uh, uh, communities or such uh, uh, backgrounds then the efficiency of the overall uh, uh, overall company can get deteriorated so uh, how do you see this particular aspect uh, uh, when we are uh, discussing or talking about affirmative actions and uh, the development of a uh, common man or uh, uh, the people who are uh, not uh, in the main fold of the society uh, we are giving them a chance to be uh, as a main part of the society so uh, how do you see this particular aspect that was the question uh, that's a great question and, and a complicated question um and i think i think your question really gets to uh, the, the much broader societal issue and one of the things you raise is this issue, well, if I'm forced to affirmative action, then I'm going to hire unqualified people. I won't be able to do whatever I, I whatever my company is, uh, and that affects my efficiency, which I think is a false premise to start with. Uh, and affirmative action and diversity never required that. But I think that that gets to the larger issue of why having diversity and affirmative action, first of all, in housing, uh, because housing may be able to control where uh, your educational opportunities, and then to have particularly, and I think that's part of the reason the United States has recognized it in an education, having affirmative actions uh, in education so that everybody has an equal opportunity for those educational settings, which then tees them up for the employment. So when they come in, they are on equal footing. Everybody is on equal footing. So you take away that issue of, well, I, I'm not sure this group will be as qualified as the other group uh, and I'm being forced to hire unqualified. I think you need to address it as a, uh, as a, structural component from the bottom up with education being an extremely key part of that um, and that was the focus on the supreme court in the united states the focus on their uh educational uh situation both in terms of upper level college in an elementary school uh, and the Supreme Court of the United States did recognize that having diversity in college education makes you a better student, makes you a more qualified student when you leave. And what was interesting in those cases, uh, there were uh, there were briefs filed on behalf of all the Fortune 500 companies coming in and saying, we want schools to be able to provide diverse individuals because it gives us a more, more one qualified and diverse workforce 
uh, and that we can sort of get beyond this issue. And we want to be able to continue to do that. And school should be uh, able to continue to do that type of thing. Did that? <clears throat> Professor, sorry for interruption. And uh, so we had uh, a discussion anyhow. So, <laughs> yes, uh, so the, uh, the, next, the question which I was actually posing is about the efficiency, whether a corporation which implements the affirmative action policy in United States, what is the efficiency aspect on efficiency whether it gets increased or decreased because in india we uh, there is an argument always raised that the reservation and the reservation people or the people who are protected constitutionally protected are less meritorious they presume this this is presumed this is not proved whereas the studies particularly the a study done for the Indian railway, which yeah, I, I think we just we probably we just talk. I, I don't I don't want to jump over you here, but we did this when you were disconnected. We talked about that a little bit, but so uh, the which I want to inform my viewer is that the a study done for the seg, uh, for the Indian railway sector, particularly the study finds that the effective implementation of reservation policy in, in India bring uh, <clears throat> increases the efficiency in administration whereas the court in the, and the people particularly the those who are in the power and the executives particularly in general they have this presumption that the efficiency gets decreased when we implement or when we recruit the people from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes or even the backward class of citizens because they believe that the merit is the monopoly of upper caste or the superior class. So how do you see this perception from the pol political and the co legally constitutional perspective also? Uh, just to give you a short answer to that, um, and I'll do it in the educational, in the Grutter versus Bollinger case, which is our University of Michigan case that went to the United States Supreme Court dealing with, with diversity in higher education. And as I mentioned before, in that case, there were fortune, there were briefs filed by many, many Fortune 500 companies and by the US military and by other large organizations supporting diversity uh, in education. And part of their argument was, one, we want diversity in education because it creates a more qualified workforce and it is better for us as employers and we are getting more qualified. If they believe that, if they believe that in fact the work force they were getting was less qualified, they wouldn't be supporting something like that. So I think most of the, the large corporations recognize, one, they are more competitive uh, and they are, com they are competitive uh, economically when they are more diverse. Uh, and the one fallacy that you so often hear that just statistically doesn't is oh affirmative action requires you to hire unqualified individuals there is nothing in affirmative action or diversity that requires you to hire somebody that is unqualified for the job uh, what it basically does say if you have a valid affirmative action program that if you have people that are equally qualified for the job and you have a valid info it is would be a prop it would be appropriate to take the person uh, that benefits from the affirmative action program, but it is not uh, some type of structure that says you need to hire unqualified people simply to have a diverse workforce. <clears throat> Professor, we are running short of time and even uh, we are about to complete our one hour scheduled uh, interview, this talk. Uh, what I will, uh, the very next question, which is about the, your reason about the equal protection rights. 
and the particularly how do you see it evolving in next two decades or the three decades because this kind of discrimination particularly on the basis of race caste and color is going on for centuries so how, where do you see the e regime of equal opportunity or the equal protection rights under the different constitutions particularly with the same theme or the same underlying principles going taking shape into the next in the future or the next immediate future that is a decade or two or even the three how do you see it as because when we talk about climate change we we are talking about by 2050 so how do you see this equal protection regime evolving by 2050 globally and in united states particularly uh, another good question uh i'm an optimist so i think in 20 years my hope is uh, we will be much closer to true equality for everyone. Uh, and that is my hope. Uh, there's also a realistic part of me, and this goes back, actually, I pulled it out for this program, but in 19, 2004, I wrote an article dealing with uh, the continual, continuing relevance of race conscious remedies and this was in 2004 and there was an argument we don't need affirmative action we don't need diversity and i wrote an article saying i think we continue to need that uh if we're going to have a truly uh equal society um justice o'connor in the um uh, Gruder versus Bollinger case wrote a quote that says uh, that we continue to need diversity in education then, but in 25 years, the hope is we don't need it. Well, 25 years is 2028, and there are some people who have opposition to affirmative action uh, that they're saying, well, time is up no longer do we need affirmative action no longer do we need diversity program i think that's a naive view um but there there is a segment of society um that believes that and um you all may have noticed but um under our previous president in the united states uh he did a very efficient job of trying to divide our nation by saying that people of color he didn't say that specifically but he certainly sent that message uh are, are taking away opportunities for white americans in an attempt to try to divide our country on that so there are individuals there are groups out there that that are divisive but the fact that we're having this conversation, and I know this conversation is occurring across the world, uh, and that our younger generation, I think, are moving toward uh, toward accepting and, and properly accepting that when we say there should be true equality, uh, we really mean that. So let's do something to accomplish that, um, and part of that will be in the hands of the supreme courts of our various nations uh there is a case that's pending possibly pending in the u.s supreme court uh, that will will revisit this whole issue of whether you can use race in education um uh, as a way to pursue either affirmative action uh, or relates, diversity efforts that relates to the harvard affirmative action program Yes, there, there's a, there was litigation filed against Harvard University. Uh, they, there was actually several cases filed against other universities across the nation by certain public interest groups that want to challenge any type of use of affirmative action, et cetera. Uh, under the previous administration, under the uh, Trump administration, they were supportive of the argument that uh, that was unconstitutional and you should not be able to do affirmative action and diversity efforts. Uh, the Biden administration has been asked by our U.S. Supreme Court, one, 
Uh, what is your position on that litigation? And two, should the Supreme Court hear it? The Biden administration has made it clear that they believe continuing use of affirmative action and diversity efforts are, are critical to our nation having true equality. Uh, they have not weighed in as to whether the Supreme Court should hear this case, which is where the case is pending. The Supreme Court has not agreed to hear it yet. Uh, they are considering whether they will, in fact, hear the case. Thank you, Professor. Uh, for our viewers, I would like to tell that the, pro the professor's work, particularly the piece which he has written, <clears throat> a scholarly work which is written in the year 2004, has been published in Hofstra Labor and Employment Law Journal. The title of the paper is The Continuing Relevance of Race Conscious Remedies and Programs in Integrating the Nation's Workforce. The theme of the paper deals with that the reservation and the particularly affirmative actions program in United States strengthens the unity and integrity of the country as, as a society fully and the United States needs to continue and which has found its support in the, in the new administration headed by Mr. President Biden. So, <clears throat> Prof uh, Professor, we, before uh, we wind up, just one concluding question, which actually, because when I read about the historical operations and the particular injustices towards a particular community or a particular society, particular group or race, like in, in a South African context against the black, there was when the it, uh, it wrote its new constitution, there was a truth and reconciliation committee which actually recommended, which investigated the crimes against the blacks and the particularly recommended various measures to offset the crimes as a compensatory measure, which you have also talked that the, yes, uh, there could be a sense of compensation. So similarly in Indian context, there has been operations and the prejudices and the particularly historical operation of a particular group namely scheduled caste and scheduled tribes for centuries. It has been going on and con today it also continues in its worst form. They are, uh, so do you re also recommend that the independent India, even at least in 70th years of its independence or the 70th years of its constitutionalism, should have a truth and reconciliation commission to investigate it to investigate the caste-based crime and recommends the compensatory and the uh, such measures so that the society at large acknowledge that yes, they were wrong in committing those crimes and that particularly in, in subjugating the or, or committing the operations against a particular group of people based on caste and color. Uh I would, I would recommend that, I, uh, but I would also add this caveat. Uh, I, I think it is important to document uh, the past, um, but I think you know, within your society, people know the same way in the United States that people know the atrocities. I, I what I would like to see is more focus on how do we get beyond that? How do we implement and move forward and provide? So the focus is forward looking. Uh, we understand what happened in the past. Here's would be effective remedies for us getting beyond that so that we can focus on true equality. And I think diversity efforts and affirmative action efforts are, are one component of that. Um, but I, I think something like that does move uh, the needle toward more equality. <clears throat> That's a very remarkable words from your side, and particularly the very enlightened, enlightening discussion, and the particularly the overview of the employment discrimination and the employment related laws from the United States of America. And uh, we had a very fruitful discussion about the race conscious programs and the particularly affirmative actions which the uh, United States follows, particularly in public 
public spheres and the private corporations, particularly in education as implemented in the United States of America. Your experience as a litigator, as a <clears throat> as one who fights for the inclusive society, as one who fights for the diversified and the race conscious programs will certainly benefit our viewers and enhance their knowledge, experience, and will look forward to the, as you said, that what should be done for the, and where, uh, where to move forward. We have to move forward to offset these discriminations and the particularly historical, op and this, this could be done through the education. As Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the chief architect of our constitution, particularly constitution of India, has always said that the education should be the key tool to fight the caste-based discrimination. Educate, agitate, and <clears throat> he has given us the uh, slogan of that educate, agitate, and move forward. So as you say, with this, we conclude the discussion and the talk today on the subject matter of affirmative actions, discrimination, civil rights, and affirmative actions, a comparative overview from the United States of America and India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, and thank you for having me, and thank you for the viewers uh, for, for listening to this.